So dealing with divorce, difficult uh, questions, biblical answers. This is lesson number nine in this series. And the title of this particular lesson, The Most Asked Questions About Divorce and Remarriage. There are lots of them, uh, but I've uh, tried to find the most asked. There's one or two that come back over and over again. So one of the most sensitive uh, issue in our, in our brotherhood in the church is the issue of <clears throat> divorce and remarriage. Uh, it does cause a lot of emotion because so many people are involved and so many have passionate feelings uh, on, the, uh, on this particular subject. And I say that you know, when, I, when I'm teaching on this uh, issue, I, I don't speak on behalf of the elders, I don't speak on behalf of the church because a lot of people have different opinions. This is my opinion based on my study, what I believe the Bible teaches about these particular things. And I'm ready to defend them, uh, but I'm not a representative uh, for the entire church. Uh, if you agree, Great, I hope you'll continue to think and pray and study so the issue will you know, become clearer, more understandable. Throughout the years I've learned more and more, I've not changed my position, but I've learned more and more about it as I've continued to study. And of course there are people who disagree and uh, some people who disagree, well you know, you're in good company, a lot of other people disagree. Uh, please uh, recognize that there may be room for growth uh, on both sides of this, uh, of this important issue. For now, let's uh, dig into the most asked and most difficult question on divorce and remarriage. Uh, you know, and we have to go down into the weeds you know, to, to discuss this because that's where the, the issue is. Some people say, you know, why do people believe this? Well, I'm going to try to explain. Why do people believe their particular view of marriage and uh, divorce and remarriage. Uh, whether they're for it, against it, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to the uh, reasons why people believe what they believe and teach what they teach. So let's first establish what most of us can agree on and what is rather clear uh, in the Bible about marriage uh, to begin with. So one man married to one woman for life. This, this is, uh, uh, and, and no separation of, of this particular union except of, uh, through the violation of this marriage through adultery or death, okay? So I think everybody agrees, uh, you know, no matter who you speak to in the church, if you give them this definition of marriage, the perfect, the ideal, uh, I mean the ideal, I've said it in other classes, uh, a man and a woman who are virgins, both of them uh, decide to marry, a lifelong commitment to one another, they contract a legal marriage, there you have it, and they stay married uh, with no adultery, no fornication throughout life and then they die and they go to heaven. That's the ideal and many people you know, reach that ideal, but that's the ideal and that's what most people can agree on uh, when they're talking about uh, marriage. The problem of disagreement occurs when we discuss the aftermath of a divorce. That's where the disagreement comes in. So a lot of the questions come, for example, can the innocent party remarry? Now let's say uh, here's a person over here, a, a woman, and her husband leaves her, divorces her. Can she remarry? That's one question. How about the guilty party? How about the one who did the, you know, the abandoning and went on? Can he remarry after the divorce or she, depending you know, on who it is? And another question, what's the proper repentance for the, quote, guilty party? How does that person repent? And, and then, of course, what do we do with people who are remarried and want to be baptized. How many times, especially in the mission field, how many times people come, they've been married, you know, they've been married 20 years to this partner and their divorce happened 20 years ago and then they hear the gospel and then they come to Christ and what do you do with those people? What's the proper repentance for those people? Can you baptize them? Can they you know, come into the church without any change of status? So these are the questions that people argue over and these are the ones I want to tackle in this lesson today. So one of the causes for disagreement revolves around the question, can a marriage be dissolved in God's eyes, and if it can, by what? Okay. Because there's this idea that once you're married in God's eyes, 
You might be able to divorce your partner, maybe that relationship is broken, but you're still married in God's eyes. Some people you know, believe that idea, and so therefore any other marriage you contract, you violate it, because in God's eyes, you're still married to your original partner. Okay? I'm not saying that I believe that or I'm teaching that. I'm just saying this is one point of view and that's why people think this way. So the passage is found in uh, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Matthew 19, 1 to 12, Ma uh, Mark 10, 11 and 12, Luke 16, 18, and 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There are a couple of others, but these are the passages that deal with marriage, divorce, remarriage. And believe it or not, there are many, many more passages that deal with baptism that deal with marriage and divorce. Okay? So I've chosen Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and Matthew 19, uh, verse 9, to look at because these two passages kind of summarize all of the others. You, you get the information in these two that the others tend to, uh, tend to repeat. So we'll concentrate on these two for for our class. All right, <clears throat> so what dissolves a marriage? First question. Let's read Matthew 19, 1 to 9. It says, when Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So in this particular passage, Jesus is not debating whether or not it is possible to, divorce, uh, to dissolve a marriage. That's not the question he's answering. He is showing what are the just and unjust reasons for doing so. This idea that, you know, the triangle idea that God is up here and the man's here and the woman's here, when they get married in God's eyes it forms this triangle and if there's a divorce down here, you know, a breaking apart of the man and the woman, they're still married in God's eyes. That's a Catholic idea. That originated in the Catholic Church and it crept into our thinking in the early 20th century by different writers. That was never an idea that was promoted by restoration thinkers. Okay? You need to understand that. The point that Jesus is making here is that a person who dissolves his marriage through divorce without just cause, meaning the fornication of the partner, the person who dissolves the marriage in an unjust way commits adultery. Now, here's where the difference of opinion comes in. Some say the breaking of the marriage vow without just cause, that's the adultery. That's, ca that's called adultery. I agree with that particular point of view. Uh, and this is a sin. Okay? Others say that the second marriage, like the remarriage, that's the adultery because there's sexual activity in this new relationship and uh, thus this is the adultery and the marriage is what's called an adulterous marriage or an unscriptural marriage. And I disagree with this position for, for many reasons. First of all, the first thing is because in the New Testament this term adulterous marriage never appears. There's no such thing as an adulterous marriage. Okay? An unscriptural marriage is a man with a man. That's an unscriptural marriage. A woman with a woman. That's an unscriptural marriage. Two or three women with one man. Three men with one woman. You know, those are unscriptural. A, man, a grown man with a child. A female child. That's unscriptural. Okay? But a, a man and a woman legally married, that's a scriptural marriage. 
irregardless of what has taken place before, and I'll explain why. Okay? One of the reasons is that the basic definition of what adultery is, we need to understand that. It can be sex outside of marriage, that's fornication and that's adultery. It can be sex with a partner who is not your spouse, that also is adultery, and it can also mean the breaking of a vow, that is also adultery. But a legally contracted marriage, even if it's a second or third marriage, this is not adultery, and it's never called adultery in the Bible. Another reason that I agree with this idea is the grammar. And here, remember I said we go down into the weeds, you know, people are not interested in the grammar, but this whole debate rests on how people see the passage and the grammar. So let me explain the grammar to you, okay? Why do some people claim that the remarriage is an act of adultery? Why do they think like that? Well, the reason is the interpretation they make based on the verb commits adultery. You know, he divorces his wife, uh, you know, except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. That commits adultery, that verb uh, construction, it all depends on how you determine the, um, how you interpret that verb, like the tenses, okay? Present tense, past tense, you know? Okay, so in the Greek, there's a, a tense called uh, punctilier, meaning it's point action, meaning it's a one-time thing. Johnny stole a car, stole. That's point action, he stole it once. He kept it for a week. Well, he didn't re-steal it every day, right? He stole it one time. He stole it, it's a crime, it's a sin, whatever, but he did that sin just one time. So that's point action. Linear action, or durative, means continuous. So you would say, Johnny went out and stole a car every day, a different car. So that means he's continually stealing cars. Okay? So the same verb stole in, in that sentence is durative, meaning it's continuous. He continually steals cars day by day and brings them into the chop shop and steals another. He's continuing in that action. So many argue that that commits adultery is in the linear mode, which means that the adultery is continuous action. So if you, if you translate it that way, this would mean that the adultery is in the remarriage and that every time sex occurs in that remarriage, it's adultery because the verb suggests an ongoing action. So he who puts away his wife, except for fornication, and marries another, com you know, commits adultery. If it's in the durative, they're translating it by saying, well, he commits adultery. He continues to commit adultery by living in that marriage and having sex with that other woman, blah, 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 and it keeps on going. Now, if you translate this verb in that way, well, there are consequences. You know, there's, there's certain other things that you have to believe in order to, you know, to maintain that particular uh, position. So this same group that contends that divorce for reasons other than fornication does not dissolve a marriage, this interpretation has created several positions in our brotherhood. Remember I said, you know, uh, the, way you, the way you interpret this verb has consequences. So here are the consequences of interpreting that sentence and that verb in this way. First of all, the adultery is committed in the remarrying. So the belief that divorce in itself cannot dissolve a marriage, plus the contention that the adultery is ongoing, creates this, quote, adulterous marriage or unscriptural marriage scenario. Now, if you believe that, then in order to become a Christian or for a Christian in such situation to repent, then that person has to dissolve their existing second marriage, let's say, and return to their first spouse. Or if that is not possible, they need to remain celibate and alone for the rest of their lives. If, you know, if, you, if this is the way you think, and, and, and you tease it out to, to the end, well, this is, this is the way you got to go. Because if you believe that that remarrying is a continuous state of adultery, if you want to repent of that, well, what do you do? Johnny stole a car. Well, how does Johnny repent? Well, he stops stealing. 
So how does Johnny, who divorced his wife and remarried, how does he repent? Well, he gives up that wife. Why? Well, he's living in continual adultery. So he needs to stop living in continual adultery. And how does he do that? Well, he, step, you know, he steps away from that second marriage. He dissolves that second marriage, goes back to the first wife. Well, she's already remarried. What does he do now? Well, he stays single the rest of his life. That's the only conclusion if this is the way that you're going to define that verb. Now, there are others who argue that the verb is in the punctiliar mode, meaning one time, which means it's a one time action. And, and I agree with them. And you know, some people say, well, that's just your opinion. But you know, a lot of people not necessarily agree with me, but there are a lot of people, well-educated people, people who teach the Greek, biblical Greek. And I've just listed a few you know, McKinney uh, at Harding University, Dr. Osborne at Pepperdine, A.T. Robertson, not a member of the Churches of Christ, but recognized as a preeminent Greek scholar in the world. He sees this, you know, uh, uh, when he translates this verb, sees it as point action. Dr. Uh, Raymond Kelsey, some, some of us are familiar with him, at the time was the, you know, known as the best Greek scholar in our brotherhood. He was a professor, he was one of my professors actually at uh, Oklahoma Christian. He's deceased now, but he also taught the very same thing. So the point that these and other scholars make is that if the part of the sentence on which the subject is conditional is puncti uh, punctiliar, meaning one time, then the conclusion is also punctiliar. This is how the action is determined. This is how the rules of grammar decide the mode. In other words, you know that verb stole, Johnny stole a car? Well, you, you have to have the rest of the sentence to understand is it a one-time thing or is it an ongoing thing? So you look, well, Johnny stole, okay, a car. Oh, it's a one-time thing. He stole one car. You know, one, that's how you determine how that verb is going to be determined. So Johnny stole a car every day this, this week and will continue to do so next week. Oh, well, wait a minute, it's still the same verb, stole, but the rest of the sentence tells you how you're going to interpret that verb. Well, he stole every day and he's going to continue next week. That's a, an ongoing, that's linear. See what I'm saying? Well, it's the same thing for this in the Greek. The rest of the sentence helps you to determine what mode, what tense that verb is going to be in. So let's look at that. Let's look at this sentence over again using this mindset. Uh, in the sentence in question, the conditional verbs are clearly punctiliar. He says, Jesus says, anyone who divorces, well, that's one time, right? Anyone who divorces. And then he says, and marries another. How many times does he marry another? One time. Therefore, the conclusion needs to be interpreted in the one time mode as well. Commits adultery. Well, how many times? Uh, one time. One time. This individual here that Jesus is talking about has done one thing one time. Now, it's still sinful. Don't get me wrong. It's still sinful. And if not forgiven, can condemn this person to hell. So let's, let's not you know, un, under, under, uh, estimate the, the seriousness of the sin. We're just trying to get the grammar right here. Okay. So if this is so, and the adultery is a one-time thing that happens when a person dissolves a marriage without just cause, then another conclusion can be drawn. And let's draw them. First of all, the breaking of the vow in order to marry another, this is the adultery. The adultery isn't in remarrying, it's the dissolving of the marriage without just cause in order to remarry. The violation of the vow. That, what, what, what do you call that when you violate the vow? Well, the Bible calls it adultery. That's that's what it is. You, you notice in the sentence, Jesus doesn't accuse the man, in this case, if a man puts away his wife, it doesn't accuse him of having sex. Notice that? It doesn't say, if a man is having sex with another woman and then divorces his wife and then marries that other, it doesn't say that. It says, if a man divorces and then remarries, 
He commits adultery without just cause. He commits adultery. So what's the sin? The sin is dissolving the marriage and then contract, dissolving the marriage unjustly and then remarrying. Okay, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the breaking of the vow in order to remarry, this constitutes adultery. Okay, number two, the marriage is dissolved. It isn't righteous, it's not pleasing to God, but it is the end of that marriage. Very important to understand that. Jesus didn't say it was impossible to dissolve a marriage. He says that men should not destroy what God had created, but they could. <laughs> God also says thou shalt not steal, but is it possible to steal? Of course. Thou shalt not murder. Is it possible to commit murder? Well, of course. Thou shalt not divorce your wife or husband. Well, but can people do that? Well, of course they can. He's saying don't do that. It's against God's law to do that. And if you do that, there will be consequences. But can people do that? Of course they can. Of course they can do it. And so divorce for any reason dissolves a marriage. It's done. It's over. And it's not only dissolved in the eyes of the law, it's dissolved in the eyes of God too. Remember I told you that triangle? That's a Catholic idea. You know why this idea you know, is so popular? It puts the power of marriage in the hands of the clergy. So that if the pe people here got a divorce, they weren't divorced in God's eyes, you had to get a papal or a bishop, the pope or the bishop or the archbishop to you know, give you permission. So it put the power into the hands of mere men uh, over the marriage and the marriage situations of the people in the church. That's why this thing operates that way. But you can't defend that with the Bible. When, when you divorce, you're done. Your marriage is done in man's eyes and in God's eyes. He may not be pleased with that. You may have done that contrary to his desire, but it's over. Okay? In Romans 7, Paul says that only death dissolves a marriage in a righteous way. Divorce dissolves a marriage in an unrighteous way. So if your spouse dies, of course you're free to remarry. But what has happened here? Well, your marriage has been dissolved. You're no longer married. You're no longer bound to that person. And it was done in a righteous way. You lived together faithfully your whole life. Good, good for you. But if your husband leaves you and then serves you with the divorce papers and you're divorced, well, that's a, a, a dissolution of a marriage in an unjust way, but it's still the dissolution of a marriage. All right. Now, number three, divorce without just cause is the sin. Remar remarriage is not the sin. So if somebody abandons their wife without just cause and then divorces her, serves her with papers, or either way, I always say the man or the woman, but either way, right? And then later on they marry somebody else. Where's the sin here? Well, the sin is in dissolving the marriage without just cause. There's the sin. And what does the Bible call that sin? Well, the Bible calls it adultery. Just like when the children of Israel were unfaithful to God, what did he call it? Adultery. Was there any sex involved? Well, of course not. They simply stopped believing in Him and started worshiping other gods. But God called that adultery. We tend to think adultery only has a sexual connotation, but in the Bible it doesn't. It, it, it really connotes faithfulness okay, to a promise. So um, divorce without just cause, that's the sin. Remarriage is not the sin. And you know why I say that? Because I, I challenge anybody here to go read through the Bible from beginning to end and find anywhere, anywhere, where a second marriage is called sin, where marriage of any kind is called sin. So the grammar shows it. It's a one-time event, this thing. If a man divorces his wife without just cause and you know, marries another, what, what did he do? Well, he sinned one time. When? Well, when he broke the alliance unjustly. 
The context shows it. Jesus says that the person remarries. Jesus, did, you know, the Lord could have kind of clarified this easily. He could have said, if a man puts away his wife except for the cause of adultery and marries another, he is guilty of an adulterous marriage. Well, that's it. Problem solved. We wouldn't be having this discussion. He says remarries. That person is remarried legally. He doesn't say the person goes into fornication or harlotry. The person is remarried. It's a real marriage. All right? So the final and the most important outcome is how we deal with both the guilty and the innocent parties in a failed marriage. And I like to call them failed marriages because it takes two people, of course, to make a successful marriage. And I've said it before, there's plenty of blame to go around when, the, when a divorce fails. Yeah, sometimes, you know, as I've said, sometimes it may be 80%, 20%, but it's never 100%, 0%. You know. Well, maybe if, the, anyways. <laughs> on the rare occasion, let, let's, let's leave it open. You know. On the rare occasion, it may be, but usually there's, there's some blame to go around. So how do we deal with the guilty party, you know, the one who's abandoned, the one who's cheated, whatever? You know, how do we deal with that person, the guilty party? Well, the guilty party is the one who dissolves the marriage for no just reason. This one is guilty of adultery. Okay? Now I'll give you an example. You have a man and he divorces his wife because he, has a job. he lives in New York, but he gets a job offer in London. And he, this guy is really married to his job, okay? loves his job, he's really career minded, gets a great opportunity in London, but her family is all there and she doesn't want to move and you know, things weren't going real well anyways. So, he's, so he, he divorces her. He's not, he chooses his job over her. Divorces her, moves to London, gets the job, married to the job, never remarries. Stay single, too busy, likes to make money and drive fast boats and you know, he's all consumed by his business. Never remarries. What sin is he guilty of? Could he say, well, I haven't sinned. I didn't get remarried. What sin is he guilty of? Well, you know what? He's guilty of adultery. Why? because he dissolved his marriage without just cause. It doesn't matter if he marries again or not. He's still guilty of that sin. And I say, give that example simply to underline the idea of where is the sin? The breaking of the vow without just cause. That's where the sin is. So to remove this sin, the person must repent and of course be baptized if he's not a Christian. And with forgiveness comes restoration with God. This is a hard thing to swallow for the quote innocent party because the innocent party wants the guilty party to suffer. And so usually the innocent party is very happy that the guilty party is never allowed to remarry, must remain celibate the rest of their life. They deserve it. Let them suffer. It made me suffer. You know? But that's not the God that we serve. Think of the parable you know, of the prodigal son. That's not that father. Forgiveness restores one with God, but not necessarily re reconciles one with the victim against whom the sin was committed. That's another hard thing for the innocent party to swallow. You mean that rotten guy gets forgiveness and he's okay with God and he can go on to be happy and everything and, and feel innocent and cleansed and here I am, I'm stuck with the three kids, I've got all the bills, you know, <laughs> that happens a lot. Some believe that for true repentance to happen, the guilty needs to dissolve the existing marriage, return to the first partner or remain celibate if that's not possible. I don't agree with this because I think it's not biblical. When I hear people debate this, usually the reason that people disagree with this idea, you know, you need to dissolve your marriage, go back to your first partner, all that, they say, well, it's just not fair. It's not, it's not merciful. Well, that may be so. My reason for disagreeing with it is it's not biblical. It isn't biblical. That's not how it works in the Bible. Grammatically, 
for example, the passage will not support the idea that remarriage is adultery. The adultery is the divorcing without just cause. This is the sin that one needs forgiveness for. I mean, it's damnable if it's not forgiven. Like I said, it can send you to hell just as well as murdering somebody can. But remarriage is not the sin. And remarriage doesn't require any forgiveness. Number two, what makes restitution to God for the destruction of the marriage is the cross of Jesus Christ. You know when I say I don't believe this, this idea because it's not biblical, it doesn't square with the gospel itself. That's where God's grace is seen. Jesus makes up to God through His death on the cross. He makes up for an act that we could never take back or retrieve even if we tried. You know that guy 20 years I said? He's been divorced. He was the guilty guy. Yes, he was the guilty guy. And he left his wife and then he married another woman and he had two kids with her and they've been married now 20 years and then he hears the gospel and the good news and he steps forward and he wants to be baptized. Can you imagine saying to that person, oh, you want to be baptized? You want to be forgiven? Oh, sorry. You're going to have to break up that marriage, say goodbye to your kids, you know, go back to that woman. She's dead. Oh, too bad, so sad. Uh, you know, maybe, you can, maybe your wife can live in one house and you can rent an apartment. You know. <laughs> really? Really? No, no, but I mean, if you just take it to its natural conclusion, it's, it's insanity. Uh, brother, uh, you, know, you, you hate quoting people that are passed away, but trust, please have trust in me, I'm quoting him accurately. Brother Kelsey, Raymond Kelsey, when he was alive, I remember bringing this issue to him by myself and we talked about this. And he told me at the time, this idea of you know, returning to the original spouse and you know, that teaching, he said, it's the single most destructive teaching in our brotherhood because it robs the gospel of its power. So if, if, if we've had missionaries go out into the field and teach this stuff out into the field. Can you imagine the damage that they've done? Again, on Pentecost Sunday, 3,000 people came forward to be baptized. You don't think among those 3,000 people there were no divorcees there? And yet the only thing they needed to do was to, they didn't say, well, oh, 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 before we baptize you, Peter says, you're going to have to go speak to John over here and he's taking car, you know, he's got the divorcees and I've got the only people in happy marriages. You know, they're, they're the only ones that are going to be baptized today. The rest of you are going to have some counseling, going to have to rearrange some housing. Of course not. God does not require for us to make restitution to Him. Jesus does this. That's the good news. Our forgiveness from God does not rest on our ability to make restitution to the victims of our sins. If so, how could we make restitution for murder or abortion? I mean, how do you make restitution for that if you're the one that has to make the restitution? If we can repent of murder and the fruit of our repentance can be seen in sorrow and never murdering again, obviously, and a changed character that does not lead us to that sin, the cross of Jesus pays for the, makes the restitution for us. I mean, we still have to pay our debt to society, but our debt to God is paid for. You know, what's our, what is the debt to society that we owe because of a divorce? Well, we have to, our debt to society is, well, we have to take care of our children. And we have to, you know, you know what I'm saying, be cooperative, do the best. Hey, we're divorced as parents, excuse me, we're divorced as individuals, you know, yes, but we're still parents together. We still have had children together. Let's, let's at least do a good job with raising our children. You know, that's the debt to society. Pay your alimony, you know, stop uh, causing problems in your family, so on and so forth. I'll give you an example of this. Paul the Apostle, what did he do? Well, he, he persecuted the church. And how did he do that? Well, he was complicit in the murder of Stephen. And then it says he went about doing what? Dragging people out of their homes and putting them in prison because they, they were Christians and beating them and so on and so forth. And then he was converted. Do you see anywhere in Paul's life where after he was converted, he went back and tried to get those people out of jail and tried to make restitution to the families he destroyed? No. 
I dare say there were still people in jail because of him when he was converted. And what did he do? He went forward. He accepted the idea that the restitution for his bad things that he did, Jesus made up for it on the cross. Why do you think, he says, and I am the chief sinner of all, he says, why? Because I persecuted the church of Christ, or the church of God. He knew, he knew what he did. He understood the gravity of what he had done. That's why he saw it. The worst thing in the world to do was what? Well, to persecute God's children. And he was guilty of that. But what did he do? Did he spend his whole life you know, trying to fix that? No, he went forward. He went forward, preached the gospel. You know. So our our repentance requires an honest acknowledgement that we have sinned and an earnest desire not to sin in this way again and change those things that have led us to this sin. I mean, if restitution is possible to the victim, it can include an attempt at reconciliation when possible. You know, people who are separated but not divorced and they come see me, you know, I encourage, come on, let's get some aggressive counseling. Let's try to fix the problem. Let's get to the root of the matter. You know, let's, let's do it. But if they're already divorced, okay, that's done. Let's move forward. What else can we do with your life now? How else can we get you back to being healthy spiritually, emotionally, and also a relation, uh, in a relationship uh, uh, perspective? You, know, you can't make repentance when the people are remarried because we'd have to sin again to do God's will. It's illogical. Again, why do I believe that? Because I feel it's unfair. Well, I do feel it's unfair and it's, 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 it's nonsense to me. But the reason that I hold to the position that I do, it's not biblical. I'll give you another example. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4. In that passage, the writer says that God did not permit a man to remarry a woman that he had previously divorced. It says, if a man puts away his wife because he finds no good thing in her, some uncleanness in her, you know, he puts her away, he says, and then after a while decides he wants to take her back to be his wife, he was not permitted to do so. You weren't allowed to remarry a woman that you had divorced according to the law. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. For this reason, Jesus and the apostles would never have taught this idea. Uh, a couple of minutes left. Number three, we never see the requirement to dissolve second marriages in the New Testament and return to the original partners in order to meet the requirements of repentance. Never, not one time. You never see it. It's never ever discussed. As I say in Acts 2.38, 3,000 were baptized that day, including many divorced people. None were, were asked to dissolve existing marriages to fulfill repentance. And think now, this is such an important thing and it causes so much controversy in the church and yet there's not a mention, not a word talking about that in the New Testament. I mean, if this was so important and if this is how what Jesus taught, you'd think it would kind of show up. You know, when Paul is talking to the Corinthians, he's talking about all kinds of things, right? He's talking about a man who's sleeping with his father's wife, you know, and all kinds of you know, terrible things. And yet this never comes up, never even mentions this. Not only in the New Testament, there's no example of any church in history, in all the history of the early church, there's not a peep, not a word, nothing discussed about this issue. I'm not talking about it in the Bible. I'm talking about commentators, the church fathers, the early writers of the church who wrote about all kinds of heresies and problems in the church. This idea of you know, dissolving a marriage in order to fulfill repentance and going back to the first, this never comes up. Silence. So guilty people need to repent and ask for forgiveness and go on with their lives. The fact that God's grace is so great for them does not provoke them to more divorce. On the contrary, it motivates them to greater fidelity and love for God and their present and future partners. You know, think of it, we'll go back to Joe who steals cars. 
So Joe is forgiven. All right? does, does the forgiveness that Joe receives from God motivate him to steal more cars? Of course not. It motivates him to be a better person, go out and get a job maybe fixing cars or driving cars. All right, the innocent part. I know we're a little late here, but just uh, give me another minute. So we read in Matthew 5, 31, 32, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This one is trickier even. The debate over this issue also includes the predicament of the innocent party or the victim. In Matthew 5.32, uh, this passage contains the same basic scene and information that Matthew 19 does, but it puts the emphasis on the victim and not the instigator of the divorce. Here the argument is not linear or point action, but active or passive tense or, 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 or voice, if you wish. So the same group that does not accept that divorce for any reason dissolves a marriage and commits adultery is in the linear mode, you know, thus making the remarriage the sin and not unjustified divorce. This same group interprets the verb commits adultery here in Matthew 5.32 in the what we call active sense. And this produces the following variety of positions. There are consequences to how you teach stuff. Number one, the innocent party in a divorce is considered an adulterer because they've been divorced, even if they've done nothing wrong. I mean, if, if, it's, an, if it's in the active tense, commits adultery, active. Okay? Secondly, the innocent party commits adultery if they remarry because they are still bound to the first marriage. Remember that triangle idea? They're still bound to the first marriage before God since a divorce on only grounds other than fornication doesn't really dissolve a marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you believe this triangle thing, you're, you're, you're separated here, but you're always married in the eyes of God. You, it's impossible to dissolve a marriage. So even the innocent victim, if they remarry, oh, they've committed adultery. Because why? Because they're still married in God's eyes, some people say. All right. And then anyone who marries them in any circumstance is also guilty of adultery. And so this teaching, you know, like I say, it has consequences. It means that even the innocent party commits adultery if they remarry. Why? Well, because they're still considered married in God's eyes. Remember I told you that's a Catholic idea. That's not a biblical idea. Now, there is another group that includes people in our brotherhood as well as distinguished scholars who hold another view. These hold that the voice of the verb, you know, commits adultery, is in the passive sense. And the burden of the passage is directed toward the guilty party and revealing the extent of the damage being done to the innocent party by divorcing them without just cause. In other words, if you translate the verb in the active sense, you put the burden on the innocent party. If you translate the verb in the passive sense, you put the burden on the guilty party where it belongs. So when the verb is in the passive mode, the sense is that, listen, everyone who divorces his wife except for the cause of unchastity adulterates her, makes her an adulteress. Now, here's the idea. The idea is that the victim is scandalized and stigmatized by being put away unjustly. In that society, the only reason for putting away justly was fornication. So one who has been put away was assumed to have been unfaithful, whether that was true or not. And in that society, only men could instigate a divorce, imagine. So if your husband put you away, even though you had done nothing wrong, society considered you an adulteress. Oh, oh, Joe put away his wife. Oh, that's terrible. What, what did she do? You see? All right. So to divorce unjustly was to taint your partner with the stigma of sexual immorality. And in the same way, anybody who married her would also be tainted 
Well, he's marrying Joe's wife. Yeah, you know, there was something shady there. You know, I don't know. Maybe she was having an affair with him. Maybe that's why he divorced her. Well, he's, so he's the rotter. Joe, Joe's the one that, you know. So what is happening here in Matthew 5? What is Jesus doing? Jesus is exposing the triple damage done by the perpetrator of an unjust divorce. One, he commits adultery. How so? He breaks the vow unjustly. Two, he destroys the marriage, right? There's a family involved here, destroys the marriage. Three, he stigmatizes the innocent party and future legitimate partners. I agree with this interpretation, again, for a couple of reasons. One, it agrees with the general principle of grace seen in the gospel. Brothers and sisters, Jesus does not victimize the victims. If the guilty can be forgiven and restored, surely the innocent can have a chance to start over as well. Only makes sense. And two, it agrees with Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15 and 28, where he says that those who have been released from spouses, meaning they've either been deserted or, or death, whatever, he says they're free to remarry. So one last, uh, uh, one last slide here. The gospel of grace offers forgiveness to the guilty and with forgiveness comes the opportunity to begin again. And grace also protects the victim and puts the responsibility for the shame brought about by divorce at the feet of the guilty party, permitting the innocent to love themselves and get on with their lives. All right, so we're going to stop here. I know we went down deep into the weeds here, but that's where the, that's, these are the causes for these, you know, why people believe what they believe. So uh, next time we're going to continue the discussion where I'm going to focus on issues for those who remarry. What about those people who remarry after being divorced? There's some issues there that I want to talk about next time. All right, thanks for your patience.